Sing a glory, glory be to God in the highest. Amen. Glory be to God. and almighty God the father of our Lord Jesus Christ the God of gods the El Shaddai the multi-breasted one the omnipotent God omniscience omnipresence the covenant keeping God we thank you we hail you we salute you we bow before you in reverence we praise and adore you we sing of your faithfulness and your goodness in our midst and in our lives and we know that you are never changing that means that what you have done before you will do again Father, we thank you for bringing us to your presence. And I ask that your word will come with power, with grace, and with wisdom. Simple enough, but with light that brings understanding to our hearts. And I pray tonight that everyone that comes in here sick will live healed. Everyone that steps in here oppressed will live delivered. That through the ministry of your word and your spirit, broken hearts will be mended. Let new seasons be activated for your children. And let your name alone be glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
clap those hands together and give God praise. And take your seats in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Now I'm grateful to God for what he's doing in our midst. And I, I, I feel to say this before we proceed. Particularly to those of us in this house. But generally to every believer that will listen. Please. Do not trivialize the ministry of the prophetic. Amen. Amen. If you heard what I said, please wave your hands. Let me say it again. Please do not trivialize or take for granted the ministry of the prophetic. While I sat there and listened to every testimony, I was wowed by what the Lord is doing in our midst. And then it occurred to me that all of this is a product of a prophetic grace and anointing that is alive in the midst of a people and i'm not making reference to a man i'm making reference to god's system for shifting men to their place in destiny there's always a word that will come to catapult you from where you are to where god wants you to be there is no other means by which god can move things in the realm of the spirit there's no other means by which God can create possibilities, divine possibilities in the natural, except through His Word, through the ministry of the prophetic. The Bible says, No prophecy is of private interpretation or the will of man. So when God sends His vessel, His instrument, into your life to speak His purposes over you, don't trivialize it. As long as you are aware and you have a witness in your spirit that this word is coming from God, don't look at the vessel. It's not about the vessel. You are just one season away or you are just one word away to your next place in destiny. And I pray that for every Sunday that will come here, both for all of us here on ground and those following online, May your word come to you in its due season. In the name of Jesus. Words in the realm of the spirit are not just for communication. Words are for creation. Words are for restoration. Words are for translation. When God speaks, his word is able to create new realities. His word is able to restore that which was lost. His word is able to shift a man, a people, from one place in destiny to the other. For some of you, while I teach is when your word will come. It may not be what I will say. For some of you, as I'm talking, the Holy Spirit, on the strength of that word, will say something to your heart. And when it is obeyed, it becomes the access to your next level. For some of you, as the word comes forth, one sentence, one principle, one scripture is all you are waiting for. The light that will shine and turn out every darkness in your life. Change your night season into morning. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's how it happens. That's why when you come to the house of God, you must pay attention. You must pay attention. Because where the word of God is present, the destinies of men are implicated. And the Lord will do us good tonight. In the name of Jesus. Oh, by the way, okay, later. The blessed life. Let's continue the series. The blessed life. God's portrait the blessed life we started two Sundays ago with the part one and um, we examined quite a lot of things the scripture tells us in Proverbs chapter 10 verse 22 where the young man from spirituality quoted that the blessings of the Lord the blessing 
I beg your pardon. He didn't say blessings. Blessing. And there is a reason why it is in singular. The blessing of the Lord. That means to God, blessing is not what you have. Blessing is what has been bestowed upon you. Blessing is the identity that you have been given in Christ Jesus. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich and adds no sorrow to him. And that's the reason why we decided to take this series to understand what it means to be called the blessed. Like we say in our I am confession, we are the redeemed, we are the called, we are the blessed. And I told us a lot of things there. I, I shared with us some requirements or some criteria necessary for a life to be called the blessed life. Number one, I told us the blessed life is the life or to be blessed is to be called of God. Remember, we are examining God's portrait. And the portrait that we are going to look at today is the life of Abraham. We saw that Abraham was called out of his father's house, out of his country, out of his kindred. To a place that God will show him. And the promise for the obedience to that call was that I will bless you. So to be blessed is to be called of God. When you are called of God, you are called into a divine purpose. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 that he has called us to a royal priesthood. He has called us to be peculiar people to show forth his marvelous light and his praises. He wants to use us to display the fullness of his riches and glory. He wants to use us as an identity, as a signature of all of the abundance that he carries and he consists. Isn't that a privilege? The Bible says he has called us as priests and kings that will rule and reign in the earth. So God is interested in your dominion. God is interested that you will reign with Christ. So to be blessed is to be called of God. I said to us again that to be blessed is to have or to receive divine promises. Abraham was a recipient of the promise. The Bible says by two immutable things, it is impossible for God to lie. When God made a promise to Abraham, he sealed it by his word and by himself, by the oath he swore. And we have been called to be recipients of that promise. That promise is the promise of the Holy Spirit that we receive by faith. And I told us that day that of all the blessing that God can give to us, the greatest or the summation of all, is his spirit that he has given to us a man that has the holy spirit has all that he needs for life and godliness a man that has the holy spirit has everything necessary to be rich and to be great as far as this earth is concerned the holy spirit is not only for falling down or speaking in tongues the bible says he has given us power to get well that power is his spirit the spirit of god can make a man intelligent it can make a man wealthy. It is true. One of the world's greatest economists. I'm doing a research on him. I will talk about him next week. I just heard and began to study of him. I was told that a revival hit one part of Malaysia several years ago. And those of you who know Malaysia, Indonesia, those are you know, countries in, in, in the Asian continent. A revival hit a place in Malaysia called, is it Barakat or Barat, something like that. And the Holy Spirit came upon this young man. Several years later, God gave him such an intelligence that made presidents begin to look for him. I will talk more about him and his name next week. He has an intelligence to work on the economy of a nation and translate them from a third world nation to a first world nation he is the brain behind singapore's economy those of you who know singapore's transformation and i think one country in, in africa that is following that kind of transformation is rwanda how many of you know the country called rwanda that was 
you know, wrecked with civil war and all of that. The economy of Rwanda is the fastest possibly, one of the fastest, fastest growing economy in, in Africa. I know that we are still carrying the title of the largest economy in Africa. But that title we are carrying, I think something should be done about it because there are about five, at least I know about four to five nations in Africa whose currencies are bigger than our own. Yes or no? But the, what I'm trust, trying to bring is this particular guy, it was not because of anything he read in school. That was his own share from the revival that came. Never underestimate the supernatural in terms of wealth and riches. Never. In fact, there is a level you cannot climb to in wealth. You can't rise to, to, to the realm of millions without being supported directly or indirectly by the supernatural. And God has given us the greatest advantage, which is His Spirit. So, to be blessed is to receive the divine promises. To be blessed is to live a life of faith like Abraham lived. The Bible says the just shall live by his faith. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Faith is the currency by which we transact in the heavenlies. Money is the currency for the earth. Faith is for the heavens. If you believe that the supernatural can superimpose on the natural, then you need to learn to live and walk by faith. A life of total dependence and trust in the God that is able to supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. You know, God promised Abraham a land, isn't it? But in the New Testament, that land that God promised Abraham to us is symbolic of Christ. Our own land is Christ. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 1, Verse 3, that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places where? In Christ. So just in case you think that was a wrong English, maybe it should have been in Christ in heavenly places. The Bible tells you it is in heavenly places in Christ, meaning in spiritual dimensions. The realm of the spirit is classified or divided into several dimensions. These dimensions or planes of existence or realms are governed by certain levels of intelligence and energy levels. That means that not everything is possible in every realm in the realm of the spirit. Because the realm of the spirit is consists of diverse realms. Are you, do you understand what I'm saying? My God, I lost this congregation. The realm of the spirit is not just one realm, no. Just like there's no, not just one city in Borno State. Or somebody says he's coming to Nigeria for the first time, and all he knows about Nigeria is Lagos and Abuja. But he doesn't know that there are 774 local governments in Nigeria, isn't it? So in the realm of the spirit, there are diverse dimensions and planes of existence. Demons are there. And they exist in different dimensions. And they can help men by supplying the wisdom in that realm. They can help men rise to the intelligence and the energy level of that realm. So that certain things that are not natural or not human will now become possible. Are we together? But faith allows you to transact with the highest of that realm, which is where God lives. In fact, God's character is faith. That's who God is. is His life. Amen? So to be blessed is to live a life of faith. And number four, to walk in obedience and the fear of the Lord. That's what it means to be blessed. These are the definitions of the blessed life. A life that has been called of God, called into glory, called into divine purposes. A life of faith, 
a life that is a recipient of divine promises and a life of obedience and what and the fear of the Lord part two the power of covenants to the Lord.
tell you one secret about worship worship is known to create easily the atmosphere of god's presence and the bible says in his presence is what fullness of joy and at your right hand pleasures so whatever you need is in the presence of god but then the bible encourages us to sing a new song that means every time you sing a new song you provoke another dimension of god's presence that you have not seen and that means new kinds of possibilities will find expression in your life i wish you believed what i'm saying so that is why worship is interwoven with everything we do here there's no restraint when we come here like this in the house of god to worship him and to give him praise isaiah chapter 51 verse 1 we give you the praise lord we give you Isaiah chapter 51 verse 1 listen to me you who follow after righteousness you who seek the Lord you know the Bible says in Matthew 6 33 seek ye first the kingdom and what is righteousness you who seek the Lord that means if we interpret this verse in the light of Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 it means that the understanding of Matthew 6.33 is tied to what we will learn in this verse. Because it says we should seek the kingdom and its righteousness. Now God is talking here. And he says those of you who seek after righteousness. There is a blueprint to follow. There is a model. You see God is a God of patterns and models. There is no guesswork in the kingdom. The kingdom is all about patterns, models and principles. You are not coming to create anything new. No. From start to finish in your Christian experience and your Christian journey, everything that you will need to understand the system of God's kingdom and to be a bona fide partaker and a citizen has been laid down. So it's not a work of, it's not a guesswork or a shadow box. No. There is a model and a pattern to follow for everything that you will become in the There is a pattern for wealth. There is a pattern for spirituality. There is a pattern for finance, for health. Everything we enjoy in the kingdom that sums up together to make us conform to the image of Christ. There are patterns to follow. That's why he says in Jeremiah, Stand ye in the ways and see for the ancient paths where the good way is you are standing in the way but you must seek for the ancient path where the good way not everywhere is the good way and you can just tell when a christian is living by guesswork they randomly apply many things just to get a particular result but the kingdom is not a kingdom of random motion i think there's a kind of motion like that but there's nothing like that in the kingdom nothing takes god by surprise everything that will happen in the kingdom was planned and well sculptured before god even started creation he, co he combined everything in what we call a wisdom and he did in a system called christ because christ is not just a person he's a system when the bible says that we have been blessed with all blessings spiritual places in heavenly places in christ that means the blessings are in heavenly places but these heavenly places places mean there are diverse expressions of that blessing they are all summed up together in an entity called christ 
That means in Christ is the revelation of the anointing. In Christ is the revelation of wealth. In Christ is the revelation of wisdom. It's a Christ has been made unto us the wisdom and the power of God. That's why your goal as a believer is not to look for how much God can give you per time. No, those are, those are chicken change. Those are fringe benefits. Being in the kingdom. Your goal is to conform to the image of Christ. And God will not judge your growth. God will not judge your fulfillment in his side based on how much you acquired in this life. It will only help you to be comfortable on earth. Do you hear what I'm saying? And we must take it serious. That's the reason why a believer that understands this will embrace the word of God. This becomes your greatest treasure. So that you can learn the ways of the kingdom. Become a master. And then step into your God-ordained purpose, which is dominion. Do you know, can I say something? God created man to have dominion. Is that true? That means if, if think of this. Imagine if every one of us are walking in dominion. Let's say, for example, in wealth. If every believer, there are over 2.3 billion Christians on earth, of which 1 billion are Catholics, or one point. If every one of us walks in dominion of wealth, imagine the kind of glory that will be revealed on this earth. But there is a path to follow. So the Bible says, you who follow after righteousness, because you are following after, there is a navigation. There is a compass that must direct you. There is a road map that you must walk with. He said, look to the rock from which you were hewn or cut. That's the meaning of the word hewn. To hewn is to cut something out of. It's a word that ge geologists use. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the whole of the pit from which you were dug. Verse 2. You think he's talking about ground or rock. No, he's talking about a man. He said, look to Abraham your father. Hold on. Verse 1 says, this instruction is to who? To all who follow after righteousness and seek God. Isn't it? Does he exclude believers? No. So both Old Testament saints and New Testament believers that are seeking after God and the righteousness of the kingdom of God. The Bible says there is one man that has modeled it. He said, look to your father. I want to show you something today. The power of covenants. I want to show you something that if you apply your life, even to your third generation, they will live on the strength of the things that you have acquired with God. He said, look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For I called him alone, the blessed life, to be called. And blessed him. And did what? Increased him. Ah. He didn't even say, look to Jesus Christ. He said, look to who? Abraham, that's the model. This, this thing about wealth, about riches, about abundance, about divine security and everything that we think the blessed life is consists of. God is telling us there is a man whose life has modeled everything. You don't need to look far. You don't need to go to a herbalist. You don't need to seek a demon. You don't need to seek a, 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 a money rituals like it's raining in Nigeria now. Huh? Money ritual. There's one I saw recently. I, I saw the story online. My ears tingled. I don't I, I I can't still believe if it is true in Nigeria that people sleep with dogs to get money. How many of you read that story? Ah, you didn't how many of you didn't hear it? Ah. I almost caught fever when I when I read that. Dog. We are trying to deal with money rituals and now why? Because of money that fades. But the Bible says, if these are the things you seek, He said, don't seek after them. There is a life that you must follow. 
there is a man who has lived and his life is a model that you can follow and enter into this reality called the blessed life that man was called abraham and we want to examine the life of this man abraham today so abraham is the divine portrait and definition of the blessed life as far as scripture is concerned no other man there were several other men in scripture that were rich and blessed but no other man modeled the blessed life like abraham galatians chapter 3 verse 13 verse 14 verse 18 and verse 8 from verse 13 and 14 he says christ has redeemed us from the cause of the law be made a curse for us for as it is written cause is everyone that hangs on the tree that the blessing of abraham might come to the gentiles how through faith isn't it and they can receive the promise of the spirit so when god called abraham he made him a promise to bless him and make him a blessing to all the families of the earth and because of that we the new testament believers in our receiving of that blessing we have become partakers of the holy ghost the sum total of that blessing that god has given to us that the blessing of abraham aside from creation the first time blessing is mentioned attached to a man is the man abraham that the blessing of abraham let's let's look at verse 18 and then we'll go to verse 8 for if the inheritance what is the inheritance the inheritance is redemption the inheritance is what redemption through the blood of jesus you know inheritance is somebody worked for something and you only come to be a partaker of it you become an heir to somebody's labor isn't it that's why inheritance in the new testament is redemption because christ suffered and died for our sins and we have been brought into the commonwealth of god that was made available through the death of jesus which is called redemption for if the inheritance is of the law it is no longer of promise but god gave it to abraham by promise that means abraham received redemption before us abraham was a partaker of the gospel before we came somebody will not believe the bible says in genesis chapter 14 when he came back from war he met a man called melchizedek and melchizedek the bible called him the king of salem and melchizedek means the king of righteousness that was just jesus the pre-incarnate form of jesus he met abraham and gave him bread and wine symbolic of the new covenant because when jesus sat at the last supper with the disciples what did he give to them bread and what he said this is my body broken for you and this is my blood of the new covenant so before even jesus came in the flesh abraham the gospel had been preached to him and he believed by faith and became a partaker no wonder when he died he didn't go to hell ah this one is this one is a knot for some people and these are basic new testament realities realities give us verse 8 And the scripture foreseeing that God will justify the Gentiles by faith foresee means it is looking into the future that God will justify the Gentiles you and I by faith did what preach the gospel to who Abraham saying that in you all the nations shall be what blessed so as far as the blessing is concerned there is one man who has caught some form of a relationship with god and became not only a partaker he became the custodian of the blessing the blessing of the gospel the blessing of the new covenant the blessing of redemption that we receive that is the umbrella for every other good thing that we will receive from god one man is a custodian of it he's called abraham that's the reason why jesus christ had to come from his loins 
Because when the Bible speaks of Abraham and his seed, is the seed, the word S there in the in, in C, the word C, the letter S is in capital letter. It was not talking about Isaac. It was talking about Jesus Christ. As then in Isaac shall your seed be called. Look at the word. In Isaac, your seed shall be called. It didn't mean that Isaac shall be. Mm -mm. It means that Isaac will become the ancestor of the one who will be called for the redemption of mankind. Thousands of years later, it became Jesus Christ. So let's look at the life of this man, Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 8. Let's study his life because the Bible says we should look at him. He's a man that God called and blessed. And if we want to be recipients of the blessing, let's study his life and see the things that are obtainable and walk into our divine inheritance. Somebody say amen. amen. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We are reading down to verse 8. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired. That means Abraham was already rich before God called him. That's why the blessings are not riches, but the blessing makes you rich. Come on, talk to me. Are you here? Because the Bible says he had possessions. And they even had money to acquire servants. So he was rich. God didn't call him and promise him riches. There's something higher than riches. It's called what? The blessing. Somebody say the blessing. the blessing. There are many rich people that cannot sleep. There are many rich people that have to go to an idol every month and offer sacrifices. There are many rich people who have to drink blood to sustain what they call wealth. That's a life of sorrow. That's the reason why the Bible says it is just this is an answer to anyone who has the hustler mentality. In Psalms 127 verse 3 I believe or verse 4. It says don't go there. It says it is in vain for you to wake up in the morning early and go to bed late and eat the bread of what? You know why I call it the bread of sorrows? Possessions that you acquired because you sweat. What was the cause that was given to the ground for Adam's sake? It said, cause be the ground for your sake. It said, you will toil on it with the sweat of your brow. So the hustler mindset is the cursed life. Did you hear what I'm saying? If you have to hustle to get everything, you are operating under a curse. And today that curse will be broken. Because if the blessing makes rich, that means the curse makes you poor. <laughs> Amen. Is someone getting something? And the people whom they have acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan, and what happened? Go on. And Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem. As far as the terrible tree of More, and the Canaanites were there in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar. To who? To the Lord, who had appeared to him. That means that altar was raised in favor of a revelation that he had of God. There are many things we are going to pick up from Abraham's life today. But I want you to note these things. First of all, like we have read from Genesis, that when God gives us a promise, our response 
should be in obedience and compliance with his will god called abraham gave him an instruction get out of your country out of your father's house to a land that i will show you every time god gives us a promise we must respond in obedience and compliance another thing we can note is that every promise particularly in the scriptures every promise is with a condition that is to be met what was the promise i will bless you the promise was not the land no the promise was what i will bless you but the instruction was get out to a land so every time a promise is given there are conditions that must be met and those conditions are met by a life of obedience another thing we can note is that when we respond to his promise in obedience like abraham did we come into covenant with god abraham responded to what god told him he obeyed he complied he did not ask questions god was calling him out of a place that has supported his existence where abraham had lived he had become wealthy and rich it's just like God telling you to leave the place where you are working and they are paying you 350,000. Leave that job and I will show you a job to apply. You know what you tell God? God, show me the job. Then I will. Yes or no? I heard, I heard somebody pray. He said, God, if it's time for me to leave this organization, let me not leave. Create an opportunity so that I just jump from there. You just jump from one place to the other. But when God gives a promise, we must meet it with obedience. And every time we respond in obedience to the conditions around the promise of God, we come into something I call covenant. And I want to explain what covenant is. Because that was what Abraham had with God that made him the custodian of the blessing. Abraham was a powerful man. The Bible says in Genesis 24 verse 1, that he had become old and God had blessed him in all things. <laughs> you will think you understand all things till you go and read the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Jesus was telling the story. And the Bible says when Lazarus died, he was carried by the angels to where? Abraham's bosom. It was it bosom was he here? No. Another word for that word bosom is harem or estate. That's the word in Greek. It means estate. And I told you that hell, the, the underworld was divided into two. I don't have time. Maybe if, it can't be here because those are teachings that are too deep. Maybe at the workers meeting, when we begin to teach about, when we, when we do a series on the book of Revelations, I will show you the underworld. Show you from scripture the different dimensions and departments that exist there. That in the underworld there are two realms there is the place called hell where satan and his demons are for now it's not hell fire are you hearing me uh-huh it's hell that's where satan's and his demons are but there's another place called paradise that's the place we call abraham's bosom that was the place that the souls of righteous men before jesus died departed to because jesus had not died and they have not received the gospel they had not been redeemed and made perfect to go to heaven so god had to give them a makeshift arrangement are you hearing me and that makeshift arrangement was a place called paradise or abraham's estate the whole of that place belonged to abraham Imagine how wealthy a man can be. That even in the realm of the spirit, he has... I wonder what he has in heaven. When the Bible speaks of 24 elders, who do, you do you ask yourself who those men are? Among billions of people that have worked with God, who are those men that end that place? They will sit down and be deciding the destinies of men. This is 
is what the, it means to be the you, that's why you must like the blessing this is something that is eternal it makes you relevant here and in eternity and the bible never told us that satan crossed at any time to go there Abraham is so blessed that the one race that is troubling the whole world now as terrorists, they were all descendants from Ishmael. That was not the son of promise, but because he came from the loins of Abraham, the Arab nations are the most wealthiest. Yes or yes? Yes. That's the impact of the blessing. You now see why foundations are very important as a believer. God has brought us into a foundation that is called Christ. Somebody say amen. So Abraham had something we call covenant. Which I told you is as a result of obedience. Man, the conditions of God's promise. We enter into a covenant with God. And that was what Abraham had. What is it? A covenant. You may not dictate maybe because of time or i may not dictate because of time so maybe you get the message and then be able to fill up this place but just listen to this covenant is an agreement binding between two or more individual entities it's an agreement or a binding between two or more individual entities with perpetual benefits or consequences it's a pact an agreement between two entities covenant is a system in God's economy that allows legal transactions between a mortal and God for those who are writing covenant is a system in God's economy that allows legal transactions between a mortal and God or a mortal and another mortal of which when kept of which when kept deploys the power and favor of god on such individuals giving them access to his promises let me read it again covenant is a system in god's economy that allows legal transactions this is my definition that allows legal transactions between a mortal and mortal and another mortal of which when kept so it's like two sides of a bargain and when the conditions are kept it deploys the power and favor of god on such individuals giving them access to his promises somebody say amen so it's a system in God's economy still on covenant covenant the surest part of God's economy every nation thrives by an economy yes or no yes or no good now covenant is the surest and strongest part of God's economy still under covenants divine covenants are perpetual and eternal they are perpetual the impact of a covenant between two people or between a man and god they are perpetual that means they have continuity they have sustainability value and they are eternal finally under covenant it is a product of god's will plus man's obedience god's will plus man's obedience somebody say it after me god's will plus man's obedience equal to covenant let's try it again god's will plus man's obedience equals to covenant all right let's say it again god's will plus man's obedience equals to what so when the will of god matches with your obedience you get something called now notice i said it is the strongest and surest part of god's economy that means if you want to know that god 
No, they play with a particular man. Look at the covenants that man has with God. Covenant reveals the nature of God as being immutable and unchanging. So if God wants to secure all that concerns you, He fabricates it in a system called covenant. He cuts a covenant with a man. And on the strength of that covenant, He remains faithful to His bargain, even when the man is unfaithful. Did you hear what I said? Many Israel drove God crazy with their sin. They were sinning to a point where it was like they were possessed. Because they'll sin against God, they'll cry, God deliver them, they'll run back to sin again. God was almost going crazy because of the sin of Israel. But God could not stop blessing them. Why? He had a covenant with their father called who? Abraham. That means if you understand the mystery and the power of covenants, you can exploit the divine. You can exploit God. There are certain things you can, in God, you can bring to your advantage. That means that your Christian experience will best make meaning and prosper when it is lived within the confines of covenant. This is like the big boys club, BBC. Abby? So small boys hang on to promise but big boys in the kingdom what's their economy covenants just the way among young men if you are not doing cryptocurrency bitcoin uh, what, <laughs> forex and all of those things you don't get money like the young man in the drama in the kingdom that class is called covenant if you see a man that has a covenant with god fear that man whether he's short he's tall he's dark he's white he's purple whether his son name is ugly whether he's from a minority tribe if he has a covenant with god ask yourself a man that went to school without slippers without shoes rose up, rose up to oust every person that he, that was leading him from a small village from a minority tribe in this country became deputy governor became governor became vice president became president don't you think there's a covenant backing that kind of a man and finished his tenure and went back he didn't die because it seems that there's a spirit of death hanging over Asurok. why is it that every democratic tenure one person must die that's why i told you last week pray for the president you don't know it's not part of my teaching but it's true there's there's a there's a stronghold in that place the, the, there are things in the foundation of nigeria that are demonic we need to check it we need to know it and rise above it or passenger became president and had his vice that spirit came again and took his wife the next tenure yaradwa and good luck he spent a few months And if not for God, they would have taken the number two. To, to survive a helicopter crash. Is that normal? So those of you who want to be politicians and all. <laughs> every seat eh, has a crown of thorns. The foundation of every seat and every throne. There are powers under it. You don't just get into a position or a system without studying what is under. You say, eh, it's just an NGO job now. Those people that do your donor, do you know where they get the money from? <laughs> Even white man sabi witchcraft too. In fact, witchcraft is an English word. Yes or no? You're not talking to me. Why? Is it is it your, is it your tribal word? Witchcraft is what? English. Even our own is not, it doesn't have many letters, juju. But their own is what? Witchcraft. Ten letters. So you think it's just about getting a job and going there. It's just about getting into a business environment. That's your next door neighbor. Do you know if he drank blood? Do you know what he put in, of, in the front of his shop in the night? 
I want to just tell you the one truth that many of us have ignored. This life is spiritual. There's nothing natural. I will never treat my life from a natural standpoint. If I switch on my TV and it refuses to on, and I've tried everything, I start speaking in tongues, I, I believe something is wrong. This is not about being spooky. This is the truth. Let's look at the life of this man, Abraham, very well. Abraham came into a covenant with God. And with all the definition of covenants I've given to you, I want to show you four covenants that Abraham had with God. Why God was so committed to blessing Abraham that even thousands of years later, Jews that don't know and accept Jesus Christ are still blessed. Anywhere you keep a Jewish man in this world, he will prosper. One of the reasons why Hitler wanted to annihilate the Jewish nation was because he was envious of their economy. He saw that these people, if they were allowed to continue, you know that was just a few years after they gained their independence. He saw that if, this, if you allow these guys to continue, they can oust world power and become a threat to us. But it seems somebody didn't tell Hitler that the covenant God caught with their forefathers was forever, was eternal. So even for 2,000 years that they were displaced from their geographical land, they still gathered back and became a nation. That's the power of covenant. One nation, if you have read of what they call the Gulf War, the Gulf War, six nations surrounded Israel. And in six days, they cleared these six nations. It's called covenant. If you are not living in a covenant with God, Kai, Kai, you can be a victim. When you become great, huh? I hope you know God and Satan will be interested in you. Because every throne and every position of authority has a spirit controlling it. When, when the promise of the Holy Ghost came on the apostles and they were speaking in tongues, what was Peter's response to the Jews when they were mocking them? Peter said, this that you see today, is that means the outpouring of the Spirit is proof that Jesus has been made Lord and Christ. So the manifestation of a Spirit is the sign of a throne. There is no position of influence in the natural or in the supernatural. That doesn't have a spiritual backup. It's good you understand it now. That's why your father died when he became manager. They say he had heart attack and died when he became regional manager. No. No. I know somebody who became a, I think he became a director. Also in a federal, he was about to become, he just became a director in a federal government parastata. And in less than a month, he came down with stroke. Until today, he can't use his one side of his body. So what sustains a man in high places is the covenant that he has caught. Either with God or with the devils of darkness. Abraham had four covenants. I give it to you and we are done tonight. Number one, the first covenant Abraham had with God was what I call the covenant of obedience. Hebrews 11 verse 8. The covenant of obedience. Hebrews 11 verse 8 is on the screen. Read the first four words at the count of three. One, two, three. By faith, Abraham. Stop there. Every time God spoke to Abraham, he moved. There was never a time it was recorded that Abraham discussed with God. How about God? God told him, take a knife, cut yourself and every male in your house. Isn't that crazy? And he took knife. God told him, sacrifice your son on the mountain that I will show you. Every time God spoke to Abraham, he obeyed. When God called him out of his father's house, out of his country, out of the place that's the economy that supported his wealth, he didn't ask questions. By faith, 
Abraham obeyed when he was called. Your obedience, your perpetual obedience to God is a covenant. Oh, I hope you know. Because every time a man responds in obedience to divine instruction, God marks him. The first time, the second time, the third time, God says, Kai, we can do business with this guy. Come, let's, let's, let's test him some more. But you, God said, give 5,000. You are still struggling with it till today. You entered in a pep. God said, pay for the other two people. You allowed them, because you came down last, you allowed them to pay. They say, okay. You know, sometimes some people allow money as though you are living for money. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive. The place didn't have name. God said to a place, I will show you. What kind of journey is that? Just the worker. Some of us, our pride will not allow us to lead almost 330 people. Because the Bible says he had 318 servants that were born in his house. In fact, maybe a thousand because each of them will have wives and children. More than a thousand people following one man. Where are we going to? He said, God will show us the place. Don't you think that one point on the journey, they say, let's, this our, we need to, he needs a consultant. Neuropsychiatric. Abraham, where will they go? I don't know, but God will show us. You see, obedience actually is foolishness to man. But it's wisdom before God. Can you cut a covenant of obedience with God? Can God trust you? Ask your neighbor, can God trust you? In your family, can God find one man at least that will never debate his instructions? God has too many rebellions on earth to deal with. covenant of obedience and he went out not knowing where he was going Abraham had the covenant of obedience number two Abraham had the covenant of consecration those of you that feel you are or you know you are called into the place of kingdom wealth and finances pay attention to this series pay attention to this series Number two is what? The covenant of consecration. Mm -hmm. This is what I call the mystery of altars. Give us Genesis chapter 12. Verse 8. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he did what? built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord chapter 13 verse 4 I want to show you another technology that was working in Abraham's life from verse 3 rather give us from verse 3 and he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai Prior to this time, God had not shown him the land. He was still moving aimlessly. To the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. The last verse of chapter 13. This is what I call the mystery of altars. Please listen carefully to this particular point. The last verse of chapter 13. Then Abraham moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mame, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. And I can show you in almost every chapter an altar to the Lord, an altar to the Lord. When you build an altar, you offer sacrifice on it. It's not just about gathering stones. And the Bible never showed us any time that Abraham sacrificed on an altar. And God said, Kai, I'll bless you for this sacrifice. Because there are many Christians who feel every time they give, God should give them back. You don't understand covenant. 
That one is still a kindergarten Christian. He's still, he's still working with promise. He's still at the ABC stage. He's still... A man of covenant knows that it is not about what I gain. It is about a pact, an agreement, a relationship. Abraham had a covenant of consecration. Now, you see, let me explain something. Consecration is actually an activity of separation, an activity that separates or sets apart a man for the use of a deity. So every time God appeared to Abraham, he will raise an altar in honor and in acknowledgement of this spiritual entity called the Lord, called God. So every altar Abraham raised was an act of consecration. Meaning he was acknowledging and setting himself apart to this God that appeared to him. This is what I call the mystery of altars. And let me tell you the truth. Your strength as a believer is based on the voice of the altars around your life. When Balak wanted to cause the children, wanted to destroy Israel, what did he do? He sent for a man called Balaam, who was a prophet. When Balaam came, what did he tell him? He said, raise an altar, seven altars, and offer seven bulls. And Balaam went to God on the strength of those sacrifices. Balaam was a man that understood the power and the mystery of altars. Now, when I talk about altars, I'm not literally now in our contextual or, you know, our contemporary society. I'm not talking about gathering stones. I'm not talking about animal sacrifice. The first altar is your heart. How sold out and separated your heart is to God. That's the beginning. That's the foundation. That's the basis for your consecration. Yes, you are in Christ Jesus, but in your heart are you separated unto him? Paul said, I beseech you dearly beloved that you offer your body as living sacrifice unto the Lord. He said, which is your reasonable, if you will ever do anything that will make sense to God, is that your body becomes a sacrifice unto him. Your body means your life. So the altar starts from your heart. How consecrated are you? Let me tell you something. God will not give or entrust kingdom wealth to a man whose heart has not been circumcised or consecrated. God will not give you kingdom assets except he can trust you. And the basis for your trust is covenant. Abraham had a covenant of consecration. Abraham was so consecrated that he, when his son was to get married, he told the servant, he said, swear that you will not give him any of the women in this land. It's called consecration. Occultic people understand it. That's the reason why they dress in a way. They move in a way. They have a symbol for everything. That symbol you see in their lifestyle. A man, all his cars are black cars. That's an occultic symbol for the deity that he's consecrated to, that empowered him to be wealthy. You, what is the symbol of consecration in your life? Your money that you have, your riches that you have, what sign can we look at that shows you where it is consecrated to God? Can I tell you something? One of the acts of consecration huh, is giving. Every time you give, your giving is an act in the natural, showing that you and all you have is consecrated to God. That's why God is crazy about givers, in case you don't know. I've never seen the Bible support a stingy man. I've never. With all due respect, I think stingy people will have their part. They cannot inherit king. No. You can't, you, you can't go to heaven as a stingy man. I don't, I don't believe it. I don't. Unless you go there and steal some of the gold in the ground and, and hold <laughs> How much did they say Asu is looking for? How much? The first time, I think it was 40 billion, ba? Okay, they have increased it now. And you hear that somebody, somebody catered 8 billion. 
I beg. In, in, uh, how long will that kind of individual stay? How long will you live on earth? Even if you say you want to eat one million every month. Somebody say consecration. You want to leave the blessing? One of the covenants that you must cut with God is the covenant of consecration. It affects your finances. It affects your spirituality. It affects your morality. The fact that you are blessed doesn't give room to lasciviousness and licentiousness. No. A blessed man knows that all I have is for two purposes. Number one, for me to be comfortable. Number two, for the advancement of the kingdom of God. To be comfortable is not to be luxurious or to be extravagant. That's why the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verse 10, he said the love of money is what? Is it 1 Timothy 6, 10 or where? But where Paul said the love of money is the root of evil. And he says that if, okay, godliness with contentment, 6 verse 6, right? Go to verse 9. Let's see. No, okay, go, go to verse 6. Let's start from verse 6, 7. I want to show you something there. Now, godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Go on. For we brought nothing into this world. I think that's verse 7. And it is certain that we will, break, we will take nothing with us. Right? Then verse 8. What does verse 8 says? And having food and clothing, with these we shall be what? So forget about what they, they brandish on social media. Some so-called celebrities go there. They carry camera to somebody's aeroplane. And they are coming down, they record it. And make you feel that they are, they are the owners of the aeroplane. Are you kidding me? One of them sang a song and said 30 billion. With all due respect, I don't believe he has that money. Let him prove by his assets if he has it. But you see, all of those things are fake life on social media, celebrity. So they are gradually indoctrinating a believer who should understand the principle of consecration to feel you can live anyhow. Now you are blessed. Now lie. You can't live anyhow. When you are sold out under the will of God, your life is controlled and regulated. You don't own everything and anything you have. You can't just spend everything you have anytime if they didn't tell you hear it today just the way they don't tell people who go to do occultism for money that you have to keep sacrificing every month forget all that social media crap the real rich people don't flaunt it have, have you have you have you asked yourself the real rich people don't flaunt it so and carry camera and just go and borrow somebody's jet for video and then they come and say, ah, this guy has money. Or somebody will go and borrow a pair of jeans from another person and borrow a gold wristwatch. And all of that is fake, fake. There is a model for how you can work with kingdom wealth. Am I saying don't enjoy the good things of this life? No. You can enjoy. But a man that is consecrated understands the law of temperance. Number three, Abraham's covenant with God. Abraham had the covenant of circumcision. I'm almost done. Abraham had the covenant of circumcision. Genesis chapter 17, verse 2, verse 10 to 13. The covenant of circumcision. There was something that God instructed Abraham to do that became a mark. It became an identity with Abraham and all that concerned him and brought them under the promise he said and i will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly what is the covenant verse 10 to 13 this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you every male child among you shall be what circumcised that was the covenant of circumcision now in their time circumcision was of course cutting off of the floor skin it was a mark that everybody in this tribe, in this country, belonged to a deity. 
But in the New Testament, the Bible calls it the circumcision not made with hands, but the circumcision of the heart. To circumcise is to cut off excess skin. So when you come into Christ, God must circumcise you by His Spirit. He will have to cut off the excess of the flesh, the excess desires. The, the, you came in with enough baggage of lust and desire. Many of us came into Christ with the hope that through Christ I will make him. No be so. And if God does not cut off that baggage in form of a mentality, it can drive you crazy. So Abraham had a covenant of circumcision. Where God will circumcise the flesh, the desire for fame, for influence. You know, killing people for ritual is not only for money. Oh. There is also ritual for fame. Oh, Kamaye, Koskavanda Bratika. There are many people in our entertainment industry whose fame is not normal. Study very well. Seller. What does he know how to sing? Nothing. He's not even that talented. But he amasses many followers. And then they gave him an award that they call the highest award, which we know is controlled by people from where? The dark side. I'm sure you know the award I'm talking about. The one that starts with letter G. I'm telling you, the Bible says in verse 10, verse Timothy 6, it says, many people have pierced themselves with many sorrows because of their lust. If God does not help you and start circumcising you, eh, it can kill you before you get to your place of destiny. So God bless me. I hate to be seeing all these needs in church. If God would just stone me two million, he has never given 50,000 before. If God would just stone you from where? Even if God will stone you, you can't stone you two million. You can't stone two million. Eh? Two million, even if it's one, one thousand naira, you can't stone it. You can't carry it and stone. It won't go far. It's like short put. It's too heavy. I'm talking two million, not two thousand. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Say, God, stone me with two million. And God is just looking at a, a terrorist waiting to happen. If I give you that two million... Okay, God decides to answer him. I'll give you the two million. Then the next month, they pay him his salary, 100,000. God say, give me 50,000. Ah. He say, I have a headache. I bind every headache. And God is telling the angels, look at him, look at him. It's called circumcision. No? Huh? How many of you watched that film many years ago? They called Bilonia's Club. As you are laughing, I hope you are learning something. When they lured that guy, that fair guy, I don't know why he likes acting all his films. He's always the victim. When they lured him into the club, they didn't tell him that, oh boy, this money will come with disturbance. And then the wife he killed started appearing. He went back to his friends. He said, what do I do? I can't sleep. They said, okay. You want to stop the dead from hunting you, ba? They said, okay, you must sacrifice one part of your body. And then everybody started showing him. One removed his cap and he saw maggots on the head. The other one removed his leg and they saw. And they were laughing and looking at him. Welcome to the club. The same way in the kingdom, hey, you can't operate in the big, big boys class if there is no circumcision. There is that mark. God will try you many times. Paul said, from henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body. How many marks do you bear for the kingdom? A man stood before a cripple, he said, such as I have. How many things do you have? Even your crisis is part of your CV. Your being broke today is part of the circumcision. It's not going to be forever. You have stayed out of job for months. It's part of the process. There is a mark God is placing in you so that when the blessing finally rests on you, no demon can challenge it. You paid your price to get there. So don't cry now. Rejoice in what you are going through. 
great men are not just made in one day no believe me that's the reason why a truly great man is humble a truly great man is humble you see them walk around as if they can't even move a fly Abraham had a covenant of circumcision let me show you something verse 26 and 27 before we leave this to the last point verse 26 and 27 of Genesis 17 so God gave him the covenant of circumcision circumcise you and all the male in your house and let it happen from ev for every descendant is my covenant with you the Bible says that very same day you see how the covenants were a support for each other because Abraham had mastered obedience the same day God spoke to him Abraham was circumcised and he started with himself the same day and his son Ishmael next verse and all the men of his house born in the house or bought with money from a foreigner were circumcised with him the same day I want you to pray one prayer as you are seated Lord circumcise my heart so that whatever you will give to me will not be used against you or your kingdom lift your voice and pray in 60 seconds please pray if you want to go far with God if you want to see the blessing materialize in your life please pray just for 60 seconds circumcise my heart I told you that the Bible says the heart of man is deceitful it can even deceive you you the owner of the heart you don't know where your heart is God cut off every baggage are you praying at all where's the drama are you praying at all cut off the excesses the lust for fame for influence the lost you say no no it's not like i love money oh. the lost for money material things father circumcise it before it kills me hallelujah number four finally before we pray I told you Abraham had the covenants of obedience, of consecration, of circumcision, and of what? Sacrifice. This is the last and we close. One more covenant Abraham had with God. And all of these covenants was a system around the blessing that was on Abraham. Abraham had the covenant of sacrifice. God told him in Genesis chapter 22 verse 1 to 5 verse 1 to 2 and then verse 5 and 12 God told him to take his only son and sacrifice him on the mountain he will show him and Abraham obeyed God he didn't ask questions the Bible says in Hebrews that the child was as good as dead in his heart Abraham understood the mystery of sacrifice somebody say sacrifice now let me teach you something let me teach you something there is no man listen to me there is no man who is truly wealthy or great in the kingdom who has avoided this law or this covenant of sacrifice there is no man who is truly great or wealthy both with god and with satan that has avoided the law of sacrifice just in case you are running away from it it will come to you I went somewhere this morning I asked them I say how many of you have ever given the kind of giving that when you finish you sit down for two weeks and you are thinking about your life if what you did was right or wrong and I was shocked to see that not many hands were raised ah if you don't have the mark of sacrifice in your life you you can be predicted your path to greatness will be narrowed why sacrifice god why can't you just do it without making me give everything at a time you know why it is sacrifice sacrifice is the last 
act of a man that makes that man look like God. You didn't hear what I said. Sacrifice is the last act of a man that makes his life qualified to look like God. The moment a man lives in sacrifices, he, has, he, he resembles God. Of course, God was not interested in Isaac. God was already going to kill Jesus thousands of years later or allow Jesus to die for the sins of the whole world. But what God was looking for was a man that could carry his identity. A man that truly had his reflection. Because the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only... Only God had that trademark. So he was looking for a man, at least just one man in a generation that looks like me. Yes, he created man in his image and is in, after his likeness. But there is a place where experience must catch up with that reality. And he found it in Abraham. Abraham took his only son. He didn't kill the child, but God considered that the guy was already sacrificed. That was one covenant Abraham caught with God. And God, what did God say? He said, surely I swear by myself. Never in scripture did God ever say that again. After God said it to Abraham, he never said it to anyone again. God said, I swear by... Well, there's no need for God to swear. He's not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should report, repent of his word. As he said, he shall he not do it. God doesn't need to swear to prove that what he says will come to pass. But a man did something that shook God. And so God had to just level the baguette. He said, I swear by myself. In blessing. That means if any man will be called a blessed man, it's you. He said, multiply and I'll multiply you as the, as the stars of heaven. And then God added something he didn't say in Genesis chapter 12. God said to him, he said, your seed shall possess the gates. I, he gave him spiritual authority. That means that the strength, the level of the authority you have in God, in the kingdom, spiritually, is determined by how much sacrifice you have before God. Put two men, one slim, one fat, before God, he doesn't look at their size. It's their sacrifice. The fat man may have nothing on his altar, like Cain had. But the slim man. Yeah, the Bible says Cain brought something from the ground, but the Bible didn't call it a sacrifice. It was Abel's offering that God called a sacrifice. I'm writing a book on that. Sacrifice. So in the kingdom, you yourself first is the sacrifice. When you now understand that you and you are the sacrifice, you will not struggle with tithing. You will not struggle with first fruit. Because you already have the mentality that you are a sacrifice question is a sacrifice alive to see how it is being used no for i have been crucified with christ yet not i that live but christ that lives where in me a man of sacrifice is a dead man god can wake him up anytime and demand anything from him he's dead and the only thing that makes him alive is what can please god by time if you don't practice the covenant of sacrifice, you can never touch divine wealth. Quote me anywhere. You may be rich, but you'll never be wealthy in God's way. Ask those who serve Satan. They will tell you. Their sacrifice is greater. It's easy to offer blood, the blood of a human being, five times every year. Is it easy? You don't want to hear the kind of things they do. I heard about one. I don't know how true it, it is. Powerful and influential individual. They say a snake always swallow him. The snake will swallow him and vomit him. <laughs> That's a man's sacrifice for power. I was told that somebody who wanted power, they told him to go and sleep in the grave for three days. And they told him to eat dead rats and dead snake. Why? Power. So in case God's own is too much, go and try Satan's own. Have you seen people in the village? They live very long. 100, 120. 
But everybody from their children's generation to their grandchildren have been dying. Every 10 years, two people will die. But they live long to 120. And just so that nobody will know that they are grand witches, they attend the traditional church in the village. And anytime they ask for contribution, they give. Not knowing that these are sorcerers that have sold themselves to Satan. Let me tell you, occultic people understand that you don't rise in this life just like that. And so there must be a covenant of sacrifice that controls you. That controls all that concerns you. Can I tell you something before we round up tonight? The covenant not only qualifies you to be rich because you are blessed, but the covenant builds a system of defense around you and all that you have. The covenant also ensures that you tap into what I call the spirit of productivity. It said, I will prove me now and I will open the windows of heaven and pour out for you blessings that you will not have room to contain. Those blessings are not material blessings. Those blessings are the promise of the Holy Ghost. In other words, the Spirit of God will come upon the man and give him ideas that can make him create systems of wealth. But the pathway is covenant. The power of covenant seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness and all other things shall be added unto you if we want to live the blessed life we must ensure that we pursue God and pursue his kingdom make sure that the kingdom of God is your priority make sure that everything you are and that you have serves his purpose let everything about you be actively involved one way or the other he said prove me now and see that's just for title how about when a man comes into a place with god and he says okay from today so so percentage of my income belongs to god and he does that for one month one year two years ten years 40 years there's a man called john d rockefeller browse about in the first millionaire in dollar in american dollar in america it was the covenant of titan he discovered he stayed with it to god to the end of his life until today rockefeller is still a brand name in the united states how many of you know transgenerational wealth is covenant that brings it archbishop benson idaosa said with his own mouth he started paying tight 10 percent and one day he told god he said you have been blessing me with this 10 percent i want to change the gain i want to give you 90 and take 10. and in his own words he gave god 90 and he took 10. he said till he's till he said that and it was said that till he died the 10 percent he could not squander it archbishop benson the Daosa was the man who started open crusade thousands of people will gather hundreds of thousands he will fly an entire team of white and black people into a nation sponsor his crusade he went around the world 150 countries billions of dollars preaching the gospel is covenant wealth that can do that one and many of us god has been trying to cut covenant with you but you are like this with god but can god trust you tonight can God bring you to a place of covenant? Is there a young man here or a young woman who is listening to me or online who says, God, I've heard all that you have said and I'm ready to enter into a covenant with you. I'm ready to use money as a defense for your kingdom. I'm ready to use money as a weapon of advancing the gospel. Many people's ambition for why they want to be wealthy is so that one day their biography will appear on the internet and their net worth just the way they have read about other people so that they will read about them the kind of cars he drives the house he lives in you know do you know my goal i will never allow social media to lay hands on what i have you will never know how much i have how many houses? In fact, the day God gives me a car, many of you will not know. You will just notice a particular car dropping me every day and then you will get to know that's his car. 
all i have i want it to be for the kingdom i'm a man on a mission i have a covenant with god and that covenant is to see that his kingdom advance and the last blood that drops out of my vein before i pass away let it advance his kingdom stand on your feet we'll have to pray today Are we ready to pray? Are we blessed tonight? Can I tell us something before we pray? Please listen, no going anywhere, just listen. In 2018 or 19, listen to this very quick story before we pray. I was on a quest to find the secret to kingdom wealth and prosperity. I never wanted to do ministry and I never wanted to do ministry because of poverty. I never wanted to be at the mercy of anybody. And I knew that the Bible has in it the answers and the solutions for everything. So I went to my Bible and began a three month study. I was trying to study about prosperity. Please listen carefully. I from scripture to scripture from cover to cover i even had to lay hold of maurice saluro's um, bible financial breakthrough and spiritual warfare i read all the chapters and verses he wrote there but in all my search i discovered the last and the only key to accessing god's divine covenant of prosperity is the covenant of giving after all is said and done that's the one key and when i began to pray for about a period of one month you know sometimes you will go on a prayer session or a prayer retreat and all through the season of prayer and fasting god may not talk to you have you experienced it it's not like god doesn't want to talk to you but god is weighing your heart you maybe you don't have the heart to contain what he's about to say to you you remember what god told Job? god was silent from chapter 3 of Job down to chapter 38 then when god had had enough he called Job. he said who is he that darkness counsel without with words that have no knowledge he said come out as a man and answer you have been talking okay let me answer you and then for two chapters god was asking questions job could not answer what did Job say in chapter 42 is he repented. He said, I've heard of you with my ears. Now I have seen you with my eyes. Sometimes when you pray and God does not answer you, it's not like God cannot answer you. He's already weighing your heart to be too small for the answer. Maybe the answer is an instruction and God is looking at you and he knows you will disobey. After one month, God came to me one night. God said, you want to walk in the path of wealth? I said, yes. He told me, bring your jota. I brought my jota. He gave me four names to write. He said, covenant yourself with a sizable amount of your possessions to this man. For as long as I tell you. The first time I tried it, it was everything I gave. And I remember there were some months I would give everything and I would have nothing for myself. But God instructed and I obeyed. And when you are obeying God, sometimes people will not know. It is the reward for the obedience that people will see. Four names, he said, every month, a covenant. This is my true story I'm telling you. I did it 2019. And gradually, God began to open doors for me and for the ministry. I remember in 2019, I was looking for a house. I didn't have the money. I made a covenant with God at the end of that year. I said, God, if you give me a house, I will give you nothing less than 10 hours of prayer every day. Prior to that time, I have not prayed for 10 hours before. But you know, out of desperation, we can just say anything. But thank God, because in covenant, God empowers you to obey Him. God heard me and He gave me the house the next year. And I started the first day, the second day, 
the third day and i saw that to keep that covenant my phone will have to be off sometimes and people began to complain those are the scars of covenant and all through the time i lived in that house every day even in sickness fast forward years later there are things that god has done in my life that i don't know when i'll be able to share it maybe two years from now last year we were paying for a land and i told god god i don't want to announce a loan i want to be part of it if you have to tear the heavens and give me a sizable blessing that will make me part of it and make me a greater in fact my vow to god was i want if there are two people that will give for this project the most it should be me and somebody i had nothing but i told god if you give me i'll, I'll do it if i have to do it first and be broke before you provide my own i'll do it and as i talk to you now by the grace of god god has blessed me with 10 hectares of land in abuja <clears throat> pastor moses you're welcome i think i shared the story with you that's what just one out of the menu covenant and now it's no longer every month sometimes it can be every week sometimes in six weeks you have given a million naira it's covenant i'm looking for something that will outlive me to my third and fourth generation when you walk in a covenant with god you are securing the future of your children you are securing the future of your ministry you are securing there are many marriages without covenants and after six months all kinds of attacks are launched on them the reason why the house didn't fall was not because of anything but that it was built on a rock it was not because of the cement that was used in building it it was not because of the iron rods it was not because of the money that was spent it was one thing it was built on a rock build your life on a sure covenant with jehovah and watch what god will do with you Lift your hands and bless the Lord for tonight. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He shares on our way. When we do his good will, he abides with us still, and is only to trust and obey. One more time, trust and obey. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. For the strong of the way to be happy. Jesus puts a trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy. Listen, there are two sets of people God is talking to me now before I make the altar call. The first set, there's a few people here with all that you have heard. Right now, you're already beginning to make a negotiation with God. And say, God, this will be between me and you for a lifetime or for so so number of years. You are saying in your heart, thank God I found the secret. And then the second set of people, God said to tell you the reason why your family cannot experience his blessing, his peace, and his greatness is because there is no man of covenant in that family before him. And you are here because God is singling you out like he did with Abraham. 
The Bible did not tell us if Abraham was the firstborn or not. The Bible says God called him and he obeyed. He trusted God. You will want to know why many people hold back from God. It's because they don't trust him. And God tells you, empty your account, give your salary. Many people disobey. Not because they want to, but they don't trust God. They feel like God is a scam. What will happen to me if I do this and nothing happens? That's why we sang this song. Trust and obey. For there's no way to be happy in Jesus. Apostle, I gave my first fruit in January. Till now, God has not blessed me. The Bible says, follow those who through faith and patience. It's not every time that God will give you money for money. Sometimes he needs to give you grace for money. Sometimes he needs to give you covenant for money. God wants to use you as an anchor for your family. Some of you are going to go into ministry. And God is just waiting for you to come into some covenant with him. Before I, got, before I started this work as an apostle, I have a covenant with God. And part of the benefit of that covenant is Isaiah chapter 51 verse 16. He said, I have put my words in your mouth and I have covered you with the shadow of my hand. That I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth. And say to Zion, you are my people. And because of that covenant, what to say on any platform, I will never lack. He said, I've put my words in your mouth. Not just words of preaching, but words of prophecy that can give hope and direction to a generation. It's on the strength of covenant. You want God to use you as a revivalist in your time. Can you come into a covenant relationship with him? Can you bend your life from the normal? And decide certain things that will exist between you and God perpetually. Some of you may be a covenant of prayer. In fact, it has been a covenant of prayer. That's why God told you to pray every 12. But you allow human weakness to come and you sleep five times in a week. And God is trying to cut covenant with you that will release his power to you. But tonight, trust and obey. But for there's no other way to be happy Jesus but to trust and obey. Sing it one more time. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy Trust and obey. No other way to be happy in Jesus. Come on, two more time, declare trust. Trust Him with your life. Trust Him with your resources. One more time, trust and obey. God is no other way to be happy with Jesus but to trust and obey. Last and only prayer tonight. Lord, I choose to trust you from this point on in my life forever. You have 60 seconds. Just pray that before God, before I make the altar call. Lift your voice and cry to him. Lord, I choose to trust you. I choose to trust you with my life, with my finances, with my intelligence, with my gifts, with my talents, with my grace, with my anointing, with my ministry. I choose to trust you with my marriage. I know that you want to use my home as a model and an example for believers. I know you want to raise children, godly children, godly seeds from my marriage. Men and women that will shake nations. 
and bring revival. Lord, I choose to trust you. Come on, lift your voice and cry to him. Some of you are going to be financial giants. You can already see it in dreams. You can see it in visions. But can you trust him? Well enough to obey when he instructs. Come and talk to God, somebody. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest spring, but holy lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking Trust him. Trust him. Choose to trust him. And let him trust you with the resources of the kingdom. Let him trust you with his glory. Let him trust you with his power. Let him trust you with wealth. Let him trust you with riches. Let him trust you with fame and influence. Let him trust you with the anointing. Because you have chosen to trust him. While we all stand, I want to give an opportunity for an altar call like we all do, like we do in every of our meetings. So if you would please just rise everybody and no movement. Let's honor God for this moment. Right now there are a lot of decisions going on in the hearts of many people. There are people cutting covenants with God. Negotiations happening in your heart between you and God. I want to tell you that you can trust God. God is not a scam. He is the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. But while we stand here, if there is anyone here that has not known the Lord Jesus, you have not given your heart to the Lord. You are not born again. But with what you have heard tonight, you want to rededicate. Maybe when you heard the word consecration, you looked at your life and discovered that there is truly nothing in your life that suggests a life that is bonded with God in intimacy. And you want to rededicate your life tonight unashamedly. You want to surrender afresh to the Lord. You want him to be Lord over your life and you want to serve him from this day onward. I'm not saying that if you have not been going to church, no. I'm saying if you want Jesus to be your Lord and Savior tonight, everybody standing here, wherever you are, 
I am kneeling down here waiting for you. I want you to meet me at the front right now at the count of 10. You are saying, I want to give my heart to the Lord. I want to surrender to Him. I want to be born again. I want Him to be Lord over my life. Or I want to reconsecrate my life or rededicate again because of what I've heard tonight. And you are not ashamed. Why don't you come and join me in front here in the next 10 seconds? Kneel down before Him and surrender. I'll count to 10. 1. 2. 3. Remember the covenant of obedience. When God speaks, obey. 4. 5. 6. Keep clapping. There will be more that will come. 7. Right now you are having a debate in your heart. Should I go or not? God is speaking to you. Come. I'm waiting for you. Come. Surrender to Jesus. 8. 9. You say, Apostle, I, I want to go out, but I'm ashamed. Let your neighbor escort you. Let your neighbor escort you. Come and surrender to him. You can never have a covenant with God if you are not redeemed by the blood of Jesus. In my life, come and take your place. In my life, come and take your place. In my life, come and take. Neumatic, please stretch your hands towards them. Those of you in front, I want you to put your right hand on your chest. You are going to say a prayer after me. I want you to mean it from the depths of your heart. This is a prayer that will restore you to the family of God. This is a prayer that will bring you into a relationship with God. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I repent of my sins. I accept your work of redemption. Thank you for saving me. I receive today eternal life. And I pledge my allegiance to you that I will serve you all the days of my life in Jesus name now put those hands up to heaven father I pray for these ones I pray that their sins be forgiven them and in the name of Jesus I declare that they are born again I pray that the life of your spirit will come into them right now let them become recipients of that eternal life and i pray that you give them the grace to know you to serve you in truth and in spirit all the days of their life thank you for saving them in jesus name we pray